Hello there, you beautiful people. I've got a question for you. Do you drink coffee or tea? Of course you do, you beautiful bastard. And that is precisely why I want to tell you about my sponsor, Twin Engine Coffee. Twin Engine Coffee grows and roasts specialty-grade coffees right on the farms in Central America. And guess what? If you happen to be a snob like me and are much too pretentious to drink coffee, you can enjoy some Keturah tea, my personal favorite, which is made from the dried fruit of the coffee plant. You take you some ginger root, a couple lemon slices, some honey, and a dash of cayenne powder, and you'll have an even sexier concoction than all the hipsters tapping away at their laptops at that high-end cafe around the corner. So again, if you enjoy great coffee or tea, support small business and this podcast by ordering from twinenginecoffee.com slash Clifton Duncan. Again, that is twinenginecoffee.com slash Clifton Duncan. There's a link in the show notes below. And now, enjoy the show. In the grand scheme of things, I mean, I have learned a lot. A lot of true colors were shown. I feel like this mm. has propelled me into new forms of artistry that I never would have considered. I've had to learn forgiveness. I've had to grow as a human being. I've had to develop a backbone. I'm a very sensitive person. And you said, alluded to at the beginning that I'm still smiling and I'm totally fine. And we've talked about this, the both of us together, but it's like that it's, it was hard. I, I finally tasted what depression felt like. I finally tasted mm. what anxiety felt like. I finally tasted what loss felt like. Hello there, ladies, gentlemen, and as always, everyone in between. My name is Clifton Duncan. This is my podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again for yet another fascinating conversation that lives at the nexus of art, entertainment, culture, and society. However you are consuming this podcast, please do me a favor. Leave me a like or a review or a comment. I'm really pushing to grow this podcast and the YouTube channel this year, so I would deeply appreciate you if you subscribed. Um, lastly, I'm looking to change the culture, so I need you to help me do that by sharing this video as much as possible. If you love it, please share it with your friends. And if you hate it, why then you can share it with your enemies. Now, all that said, uh, my guest today, um, is a pretty big deal. She's pretty fancy, though. She would never, never say that uh, her, herself. Um, she burst onto the scene uh, starring as a... What, what role did you play in Greece? I forget, it was, was it Sandy? I played Sandy. I wanted this TV reality show in 2007 that cast me as Sandy in Greece on Broadway. Right. And then she went to play... Uh, then she went on Broadway to do that. She did Nellie Forbush, a South Pacific, Anything Goes. She was Hope, uh, Hope Harcourt. Um, she starred as Bonnie in the Bonnie and Clyde musical for which she received a Tony nomination. Um, she also starred in the title role of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella on Broadway, for which she received a Drama Desk Award and her second Tony nomination. She's done all kinds of stuff. She just released a new LP or EP, I should say. And uh, we'll talk about that later on. But, uh, I, you know, there's not much else I can say. Otherwise, I risk um, uh, becoming a bit of a simp. So I'll just introduce <laughs> my guest officially. <laughs> She's happily married, by the way. Miss um, <laughs> Laura Asnes, how are you doing? I'm so glad Hi, you, uh, you joined me. <laughs> thank you for that beautiful introduction. And thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here and um, just have so much respect for what you're doing. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, so Laura is a, I'll tell you how good an actress Laura is. So I actually, I accidentally um, did my intro without recording any of it. And uh, see, we're both pros. And uh, we said, you know what, we'll go back and do it all over again, as if it were the first time, which is what we do um, as as actors. And, um, you know, and <laughs> so you were completely genuine. I, I was convinced I bought it. Uh, and in short, you. Uh, you booked it. <laughs> so Huzzah! Isn't that great? So the, the, Likewise, the first, by the way. 
oh, well, well, thank you, you know, but uh, I'm not the one uh, auditioning here. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. So my first question for you then is how on earth did you find your way into the crazy world of theater? Or was that always, or was that your first um, love or was it something else? It was my first love. My particular story was that I think I was singing before I could talk and dancing before I could walk. And uh, I started acting out musicals in my living room when I was little and playing all the roles. And I did my first real show in second grade. I played a munchkin in The Wizard of Oz and the theater bug bit. And I did not have any lines. I was like not a feature. I was not a featured munchkin, but I loved it. And I remember looking up to Dorothy and thinking like, I want to do that someday. I want to sing the song and wear the dress and carry the show. And um, I did get to play Dorothy twice in my youth as I got older, um, but it was really that moment. And um, I think my parents saw that I had a gift for it and a passion for it and we're, we're able to provide the opportunities and say yes. And I worked a lot in Minneapolis, which is where I'm from, doing kind of a combination of professional theater and school, school shows as well. Okay. So, okay. So then the, the next question, I mean, what, what was it that, that, that got you? Was it, uh, was it the music? Was it the, uh, the, the splendor, the spectacle? Cause you also said you wanted to carry the show, which I feel like is a sort of a big thing for a, a child to say of, of wanting to take on that responsibility. Was it just like the I magic? Think, yeah, no, I think I, I always really loved storytelling first and foremost. Um, and I also enjoyed singing, dancing, and acting. And I found that musical theater was the place that I could do all three. I didn't want to just be a dancer. I didn't want to just be a singer. And if I did a straight play, I'm like, I would, or a movie or TV film or something, I'm like, well, I missed the music. I think singing first and foremost was my bread and butter. Like, mm. I know, I knew how to sparkle when I sang. And so, um, but it wasn't just in a recording studio. I, I loved the storytelling aspect of singing in a musical theater production and becoming another character and getting paid to play pretend um, or getting to play pretend. Obviously I didn't get paid in second grade playing a munchkin in the Wizard of Oz. Um, <laughs> but I, it was kind of the one thing I always wanted to do. I kind of had my, my heart set on it from a very young age. I didn't really have any other interest. I didn't develop any other skills. I put all my <laughs> eggs in that, in those creative baskets and um, thankfully got to do it for a very long time. So then what's your favorite show? That I've done or that I've seen? Either or read or heard. I feel like, okay. <laughs> First of all, people ask that question a lot. And for me, um, I know it's not fair. It's, it isn't because of the shows that I've done, and maybe you would say the same thing. I, w I will want to know your, your answer to this question as well. But of the shows that I've done, I feel like all my roles are like my children. And I'm like, I can't choose my favorite. Like they're all very special to me for different reasons. And they yeah. came in moments of my life when I needed them. And I learned from each of them. Um, and so it's very hard. One, you know, one was joyful. One was fulfilling. One was challenging. One was healing. You know, it's like they all meant something to me and they're a part of me. And so it's hard to choose a favorite. I think of shows that I've seen, I think there are specific performances that stand out, ones that really inspired me throughout my career. Um, I saw a performance of Aida when I was in high school on Broadway. We got last minute rush tickets and I sat in the fifth row and it was a Sunday matinee randomly. Mm -hmm. And there were like two standing ovations like during the show for some reason, like, and I will never forget being at that performance. I saw Light in the Piazza with mm -hmm. the original company. And that was a very compelling, inspirational moment. I saw Peter Pan when it toured through Minneapolis with Kathy Rigby when I was a kid. And like oh, nice. that magic was something that really inspired me. I also saw a tour of Miss Saigon way back when that very much inspired me. So I think there are things along the way. I saw Newsies like seven times because I had so many friends in it and that became a favorite of the season. So I, it, I think it varies. I, there are so many, you know, shows and musicals that have had an impact on me. Yeah, well, that's a dodge, but it's fine. I um, there's I it's it's uh, it's interesting. I had a friend who once said that uh, actors don't choose the roles; the roles choose them. And um, depending on where you are in your life, um, it means something different to you. I mean, um, uh, so I guess what you know, what was what did 
playing Bonnie mean to you versus playing Cinderella? You know, did those mean anything different to you or did they have a different impact on you? And, um, yes. you know what I mean? Like, is, is it that kind of, um, like, where did those yeah. catch you at your, at those respective points in your life? Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to go back and say, I'll, I'll just give the little one-liners for each because Greece was my Broadway debut. And that was great because Sandy was like very in my wheelhouse. I actually was playing Sandy in a regional production when I auditioned for the reality show and ended up winning it. So I already mm. knew Sandy and I felt akin to her. Um, and that was just joyful. My next show was South Pacific and I replaced Kelly O'Hara who had Oof. just like been nominated for Tony Award. Did she win? She might've won that year. Oh, I, don't I know remember. Paolo shot won. My, my co-star won that year and the show was getting recognized and those were huge shoes to fill. And I like to say that I grew from being a girl to being a woman during my time as Nellie. Mm. I was 23. I went through a series of four callbacks to get that role and was shocked when I got it. But I grew up during my time as Nellie. And then anything goes, I um, I actually lost my mom to cancer while I was playing mm. Hope Harcourt. Literally, wow. my character's name was Hope. And uh, that show became my escape in a really hard season in my life. And I'm very, very grateful for that and for what that was. And then Bonnie was the first role I got to originate. So I was a part of Bonnie and Clyde from the ground up. And it was a series of three and a half years of my life before it finally came to Broadway. And then it only lasted for two months. It was not a, a, a critical success. And yet I got a surprise Tony nomination five months later after the show had closed. Mm -hmm. And um, the show has lived on in ways that I never thought possible through the cast album. And, um, you know, getting to originate a role was very fulfilling. And Bonnie, very, uh, it was fun to be the bad girl. You know what I mean? It was a, it was a challenge. I got to, yeah explore a new side of my voice and um, try to make this villain relatable and have compassion. And she's obviously a, a historical character. So I got to do research about a human being that actually existed and, and try to pay um, homage to the person that Bonnie was. Um, and then Cinderella was just a joy. Um, and I didn't realize that was going to be such a moment in my career. Um, Cinderella was another one kind of like Sandy where it felt very in my wheelhouse where I was, um, it wasn't like a challenge. It was more exhausting than anything, but like, just because she never left the stage and she's running around all the time, but it was, it, I felt honored to get the recognition, uh, that I did for that because it just, it felt like such a kind of natural fit the shoe fit so to speak oh, oh. Um, and that was just it was just a joy to go to work every day and I loved the cast um and then bandstand was after that and that was rewarding and fulfilling and um it was more than entertainment it was more than a job it felt like we were actually healing people who were coming to see it and mm -hmm. there was a cause that we were supporting that was so much bigger than ourselves and there was something very fulfilling about that so that's the rundown where it's like, yes, that's why each one is played such a, a special role and was very different and specific for different reasons. No, I hear that. I'm really interested in this um, idea of you growing up uh, when you're playing Nelly and, and maturing. Because I know when I did, um, I did a show called The Scottsboro Boys in California yes. um, a long time ago. And it's about just about just over 10 years ago, actually. And it was funny because, you know, I'm I'm an actor and a singer, but I, I suck at dancing. I, I you know, in, in, in showbiz, uh, for those who don't know, we have a, a distinction between uh, people who can't dance at all, people who are dancers and people who are what they call movers. I am what they call a mover. And uh, I, I worked with a great actor named I want to say J.C. Holiday. Um, and he, he said, uh, he said, yeah, I'm a mover. When the dancing starts, I move out the way. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, 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 that pretty much it, is, is it. But uh, for those who don't know, the show is based on the, uh, a, a true incident uh, in Alabama, 1933. These nine black kids were, were accused, falsely accused of uh, sexual assault by these two white women. And it became a big, big scandal, a big story. And this is Jim Crow America, obviously. And the show itself was uh, adapted. Oh, excuse me, the event was adapted into a musical by the same people that did uh, Cabaret in Chicago, uh, Kander and Ebb. Uh, Susan Stroman also helped create it, uh, you know, just a brilliant, brilliant uh, dancer and choreographer on Broadway. And the, the, the genius of the show is that it was done in sort of a minstrel setting, uh, and it, you know, as, as a minstrel show. And uh, because it was a show trial and, uh, you know, racism and all that other stuff. 
And I remember for that show, um, just the the dancing demands, the singing demands. John Kander said, you know, you could really use some singing lessons. And he was right. <laughs> he was correct. But by the end of it. Oh, honesty. Yeah. Well, but you, you, but we need that, don't we? But by the end of it, he's like, you yes. know, you, you really strike me as a, as a you know, a, I think the word he used was perfect actor. I would like, like to see where, where you go. Ah. And then, and then uh, the career got cut That's short cool. for reasons we might get into. But um, I remember during that show, just the level of of emotional turmoil and just getting all the, the the staging and choreography and the acting and feeling like you're sort of you have to be a leader and set an example in some way when you're in in these in these big roles you have these big shoes to fill i know for me that that show really it it, it demonstrated to myself like oh wait okay i'm capable of more than i thought i was 100 percent. you know i can you know and i can step up and meet the material so what was it like uh, working for uh, on uh, on nelly for you is that sort of a similar kind of a thing exactly i'm like everything you're saying i'm like that's it i it challenged me forced me to have to stretch beyond what i thought was possible and bart Scher is a brilliant director and you know there are moments where that can be intimidating and i'll be honest and say yes i was intimidated in moments in the rehearsal room but he also knew how to pull me in directions that i wouldn't have uh been able to do on my own and so um you look back and you go oh like that's that was a very useful experience and i was forced to have to step up to the plate and not only fill kelly o'hara's shoes but also uh, you know all of the nellies that came before me and the show was so classy we're at lincoln center this is a big deal i was 21 and i was the reality tv show girl and so mm. it felt like a moment for me to be legitimized within the community and i could not be more grateful that that door opened for me and i'll just say too it, it, during these same two weeks that i was in callbacks for south pacific i was also in callbacks for little mermaid on broadway to replace sierra Bogus. Mm. and i was in the final six for that and i found out i didn't get it and i was like devastated i like cried and then the next day found out that i had booked south pacific and i think at the time my heart felt a little more connected to Ariel and wanting to play that role. Mm -hmm. But in the grand scheme of my career, I go South Pacific was so much more um, meaningful and so much more important in in that. And I think, you know, I I had to grow up. I, I had to learn those lessons and step into that as where Ariel would have been a continuation of Sandy and, you know, the the youthful princess, whatever. And I got to do the, you know, I got to do Cinderella later, but South Pacific was so important in my growth as an artist and as a human. You know, I think that, um, I mean, I love to hear you say that because I don't think that people really understand. Well, I think one of the things that I want to do is to try to communicate to a broader audience the kind of um, work and the, that, that we put in. I think a lot of people see, oh, you know, they, they only work at nights and, uh, you know, eight times a week and it looks like a lot of fun, but there's so much... Um, there's so much pressure and so much discipline, um, so much training that goes into being at that level of performance. Um, even just in the, um, did you say you had four callbacks for um, South for Pacific? South Pacific? Yes. Yeah, and and the, I don't know if the, you know if it was the same for you, but the way these things go was that each time you go back into the room, there's like more and more people in there. Yep, <laughs> You're like, exactly who, it. Who 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 are you? And uh, so you know, it's got to give a <laughs> shout out to uh, you know performers. And and what's really heartbreaking about the industry is that, um, you know, it's just not fair. It really isn't. And um, anyone who tries to tell you that it is, is lying to you. Anyone who says, I mean, I've had actors who've been offended that uh, when you mention that luck plays any part in um, in what you're doing. But it's, you know, a role like that comes along, Kelly O'Hara is leaving, and you have, you know... <laughs> just what Bartlett share is looking for. And, you know, you're, you're in good voice and, you know, you're, you're able to right. perform on the day. And every time you go into this room, there's like 8,000 new people in there who are like judging you and picking you apart. And, you know, and this, this is, these are like life changing jobs that we're talking about uh, in, yeah. in a lot of ways. And uh, it, it, the kind of unbelievable courage and bravery that it takes for a lot of performance, it's not, it's not digging ditches, you know, we're not uh, we're not in the secret service we understand that or the military but th there's when when you look at how people are afraid just to do public speaking um think about oh, what yeah. it is to open yourself up to you know and singing and uh you know again being picked apart by an, an increasing array of people who could be the difference between you not eating and then you being able to send your kids to college it's, uh, it, I mean so well said and I think a lot of people don't acknowledge that or don't really realize that if you 
are outside of the industry. And I think it's a fine balance. It makes you realize, why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? You have to really love it. And I think you have to be called to it in a way, because if you're not, then it's it's way too hard to do it. My husband and I met doing a musical together and he always enjoyed theater as a hobby and is quite mm-hmm. talented and pursued theater in New York for like a year and a half, went to auditions and then realized he's like, this doesn't actually wake me up in the morning. Like he loves the high of being on stage and performing, but doesn't, didn't enjoy the process. And you have to be able to enjoy the process and even begin to enjoy auditions because it's a, it's a regular part of life. And as they say, you, you know, you hear 99 no's for every one yes. And even through a very blessed, favored career that I felt I had, there were also a million no's that came along with it. Like you said, the, the the other side of the story that people don't see and don't hear. And so many times you do show up and you don't get it, but all of those prepare you. And each of those auditions is a chance to learn and get better and push yourself and also continue to develop your own confidence. You can't, you can't hold your, your own worth and your own value in if you book the job or what other people think about you, you have to know intrinsically that you are special and you have a gift and you are called to do it and walk in the room and just share the best version of yourself in that moment. And if it doesn't go your way, you say, okay, I'll get, I'll get it next time. That wasn't meant to be, which is very hard to hear. No, after no, after no, after no. Um, and sometimes people get burnt out doing it. And sometimes, you know, people stick with it and some people are made to do it and some people aren't. And it's, it's hard. And just because you don't make it on Broadway doesn't mean you've failed. I hope people realize that too, that it's like, there are so many ways to create and to share gifts. And you and I both have had to figure out new ways to be creative in this season. And, uh, it's, it's a lot. The, the endurance and the fortitude that it takes to be an actor, a performer, an artist um, is, yes, it goes deep. Well, you know, and it's, and it's interesting because I think that the view of a lot of people, and it's not, it's not entirely a, a misplaced view, but it's like, oh, you know, these actors, they're soft, they're pampered. And in a way, we sort of have to be soft because that's just the nature of our craft, right? We have to be open. We have to be vulnerable, vulnerable on a regular basis uh, in a way that uh, normal people, I'll use the word normal here, uh, simply don't have to be. And, um, you know, it's funny because I was going to ask you, how on earth did you sort of <laughs> keep your cool through all of that? I mean, I know it wasn't, you know, you couldn't, you know, you're not a robot, so you couldn't do it all the time. But um, throughout all of that, you seemed to have come out uh, the other end um, pretty, pretty decently, you know, all all your hairs are in the right places, and you you still smile, and you got a twinkle in your Mm -hmm. eye that that hasn't seemed to have uh, um, ruined you too much. But uh, because I think one a big thing as well is that there's a very, I, I actually sort of hated living in New York by the end of it. It was cute um, at the beginning. Um, you know, you're a, a plucky young 20 something and there's all kinds of lights and people and sounds and and noises. And then over time I said, you know, I'm only here because of the industry. And professionally <laughs> things began to go well for me, but I was like, man, I just sort of, I don't know if it's worth it because I kind of, uh, I kind of hate my life in some ways. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I guess, yeah, that, that's my question is how did you, how were you able to stay afloat? Because there's, there's also the pressure of like living in New York City, which, you know, I feel like it's the best place to be an actor because of all the cultural institutions and just all the people watching you can do at the very least. Yeah. Um, but it's also kind of the worst place because it's so freaking difficult unless you're rich um, to live there and sustain, especially if you're a broke artist. So how did you sustain during all that time? Uh, it's, I feel like there was a, I know, I feel like there was a, a grace over my time in the city and that I always did enjoy it while I was there. And I think the minute you begin to go, this is miserable and I'm not happy. There's no one making you stay, requiring you to stay. And I live in Tennessee now and there's I've been here for the last year and a half and it's been the most like healing restorative place to be, but I never knew what I was missing. (laughs) Um, I feel like for me, it was like, while I was in New York, I was, I was supposed to be there and that was, it was great. And I, I loved it. And I would have people go like, well, do you feel safe? And I was like, I do actually, 
and not to say I'm not aware and things aren't, you know, happening, but I was like, the minute I didn't feel that there was a clear shift for me and we can get into my story. Like I'm not opposed to going there, but there was a clear shift for me where I was like, I need to get out of New York. Hmm. And I never, I couldn't run fast enough away from the city. And I think if that if, if that, if you come to that, if you come to, I'm actually miserable here, I'm not happy anymore, then great. Dust, dust your feet off and, and move to a new place. Like there's, there's no shame in that. And I feel like the industry does shame people. I feel like COVID, you know, that changed a lot of things and in the industry, um, you know, everything was shut down for a while. And a lot of people had to move out of the city for other reasons, because they, literally couldn't work even if you were scrambling paycheck to paycheck before you literally couldn't you know no one was finding work so I think that in a good way maybe shifted the mentality decentralizing talent from being in New York City or being in Hollywood and going wait we can create art in other places Mm. um like Broadway doesn't have to own creativity or own musical theater Um, But I think for my time in the city, sorry, going back to your question, like there was, there was a, I, I did enjoy it while I was there and God provided enough things for me to do. Even when shows unexpectedly closed, it suddenly made me available to explore doing concerts. And I, I co-created and made several, I did several solo concerts. I have like four different solo shows that I did over the years. And then I co-created this princess concert and, um, I found other new ways to be creative when I wasn't doing eight shows a week. Um, And I think that was exciting also and stretched me in new ways, you know, that I I wouldn't have found had I just always been doing eight shows, but I did get, you know, I, I look back now and I go, there was, I had some incredible opportunities and I'm beginning now to remember in color, all of those memories. I had a painful experience leaving the city and I think all of it, I kind of discounted everything and everything turned into a painful memory. And now a year and a half out, I feel like I've had some healing enough to go like, wait, that was good for what it was, right? Like I can see a picture from Cinderella and go, that was actually special. (laughs) And it's worth remembering with joy. Um, But the industry has shifted a lot. And um, right now I'm like, I. I don't have a desire to be there. And I'm actually glad that I don't, because if I did, then I would, then that would be hard for me. I look now and I go, cool. I had my time in the city and now there's something else for me. Um, And that's, it's been an interesting journey for sure. I thought I was going to be a New Yorker for life. So friends, Laura has been purged from the industry um, for no other reason than that she's far too good to be in it as a person. Um, but you know, but you, you, you brought it up, so, so you know, we'll, we'll go there. But th- this idea of how the industry has changed and people are leaving New York, I love that you, that you used the term uh, decentralization, because I think, I think, think, it's, think it's very important uh, myself. But you know, I mean, the, the, the pandemic had a lot to do with it, but even beforehand, especially with regard to you, um, this has been something that prompted me to speak up originally, because uh, especially after George Floyd died, I saw that there were so many um, shifts that were happening very, very swiftly in the industry. And, um, you know, for me, I've always kind of been an outlier. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because I began doing theater. I was like, oh, you know, these people are weird like me. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but now I, I found that uh, I'm less weird than uh, maybe some of the, uh, the weirdos that I used to uh, uh, really enjoy being around. And um, I say all of that to say that one thing that's bothered me for a very long time um, as someone who thinks that, uh, you know, art is for everyone, theater is for everyone. Yes, um, yes. You know, th- there is a very, very rigid um, culture in in the arts. And, you know, we talk about it. I mean, Hollywood gets a lot of press as far as their sort of ideological rigidity. But I tell people it's like 10 times more concentrated in the theater. And with regard to you, and I'm, I, we, we've been sitting here for about half an hour, and I don't know if anyone could actually watch this tape and be like, well, she's a horrible person and clearly a Nazi. And yet I would go online, um, especially at the beginning of a lot of this stuff, and some of the most awful things 
um, were said about you, tweeted about you, um, you know, on theater, Twitter, and in other places. And for me, it, it seems to boil down to no, for no other reason that, that um, you know, you self-identify as a Christian conservative. Forgive me if I'm wrong. And for me, you know, well, I, I, I... And I was never outspoken about that. I don't. I don't on my platform. I'm not political. I'm not... Right. I've been rarely spiritual on my platform. I have a... I have a I have a Bible verse in my bio. And if that's offensive, then I mean, okay. But I, I never used my platform for that. I'm, and now I, now that I live here, I'm like, man, was I even effective? I mean, living up to the person and I still got canceled um, for not being very outspoken about anything <laughs> politically or spiritually at all. So it's very interesting how it all went down. So did it, I mean, did it, do you ever clash with anybody? Do you think it, it ever um, it impacted your career? I mean, it's, it's, you know, a, a great career, obviously, but, you know, I, I just, I, I look at myself and I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I identify as a liberal atheist, although like all of my Christian friends now are like, ah, you, you say that now, which is really funny. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, but, uh, you know, cause we, cause we met very briefly. We did, you know, this Bonnie and not, not Bonnie and Clyde, um, Houdini, Houdini. Uh, musical. And, and it was funny because um, with you, I was like, first of all, she answers emails right away. Uh, second, <laughs> secondly, she's like the, the, the nicest, most uh, kind person. And I can tell that she's driven. Um, there's a reason that she is where she is. And yet people just say the most awful things. And I'm just th and I'm thinking to myself, like, it doesn't make any sense. And there's, I think of other actors like Chad Kimball's another one who, uh, who did Memphis for a long time. I think he's doing Come From Away now. And, um, yeah. you know, and I don't want, I think... Uh, it, I hope it's apocryphal, but apparently at one point, Stephen Sondheim once said that, that, you know, I'm glad that we're, I'm glad we're in an industry uh, that's, that has no Republicans in it. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, 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 um, I paraphrased Michael Jordan once at a, at a meeting, at a gathering of other artists, and I, I froze the room, but I paraphrased Michael Jordan by saying, you know, well, Republicans buy tickets too. And, you know, it, and if it's the party of all, of all the rich oligarchs and all this other stuff, I'm like, well, don't you want their money to support, you know, to support the work that we do. And especially now when it seems as though, um, you know, if you watch the news or you go on social media, we're so divided. And I feel like artists right yes. now are playing a huge part in driving that division. And um, part of the issue is that even in our own house, like I don't care what your beliefs are. Can you match harmonies with me? Can you build right. a scene with me? What kind exactly. of chemistry do we have? Like it's, it shouldn't, it literally shouldn't matter yet. It, it seems to matter to so many people so much. I just don't get it. It's so well said. I, I have like four things I wanted to say, and I hope I remember them all. Um, <laughs> but that first and foremost, I agree with you that art and should be for everybody. And for some reason, the industry particularly became very political since COVID. And I've I've actually never really cared about politics. I've never been political. Actually, I I would say I was I didn't really do research and didn't really know. I feel like in the last two years I've become more political because policy radically affected my life. Right. And I would say that I I more got canceled for being unvaccinated. And for some reason, and I'm just gonna say it, I, that's what happened. And when people found that out, they assumed all of these other things about me. Mm -hmm. And that's what that article stated. And my 15 year reputation of being a, hopefully a kind and loving person, a hard worker, someone who was talented, that went out the window and meant nothing when people found out this one thing about me. And that's what I find was very difficult and shocking and hurtful to swallow is that people who knew me and knew my character and who I was and what I stood for disregarded all of that because of this one thing. And if, and because of this one thing, it meant that I was all of these other things, which just basically aren't true, wasn't true. And so that's, I think what was, what was hard and has taken time to heal and forgive and made me want to go, well, if that's the way you're going to be, when you claim to be very inclusive and tolerant, when I've wanted to include and tolerate and love on you for the last 15 years, mm -hmm. then I don't actually want to be a part of a community that, that says one thing and is clearly being another way and saying so many hateful things. I was like, get me out. I, I need to find some new people. Now. So, a, I, I would argue that um, 
you know, it's always been a very political industry, but it seemed to metastasize once Trump was elected. And, uh, you know, which I, I just watched everybody go insane. It's like, guys, I, I didn't vote for him, but you've lost your minds. Um, but, you know, so so walk us through this story, because I because it, it came to my attention. And by the way, given everything you've just said, it was funny because I remember when we were doing this Houdini reading, and um, I mentioned that I had taken a job, like I had a job at that point. And I remember you gasping, <laughs> like, you have a job, you know, and I was like, yeah, I was working a nightclub, like literally every night my job, and they tried to make us wear masks, but obviously we couldn't do that, uh, you know, because, you know, it's one in the morning, the music is playing and people are drunk and fighting. We need to be able to communicate clearly. So, you know, I'm working on, on security. That's, that's, that's where I was working. Um, okay. And you know, so my job while while New York was like shut down, I'm literally in people's faces, you know, drunk people screaming, screaming in my face. I'm stopping fights, uh, you know, and people were just hanging out and the bars were packed. The clubs were packed. The strip clubs were open like there were so many. So, so, I'm in Atlanta. So it's, there was so much stuff that was open. Okay. And um, but I remember you were, you were like, oh, my God. And I was like, right. Yeah, I, I got a job. So the, the, the we, we were taught and told to stay alone, be isolated. Right. I had to make a trip to Tennessee as well for a like home concert that I was doing with a friend of mine here in September of 2020. And we drove downtown and Broadway here was like packed with people. And I was like, oh, keep the windows rolled up. Like we were taught and told to be afraid and didn't yeah. know any different. Yeah, you know, and uh, so I, I just say all that to, to highlight that, uh, you know, because when your fiasco came to my attention, and this is how this is how I received it, um, is that you were doing a show, I think, in the Hamptons or something. And then it came it a one out, night concert, a concert in, in, in the Hamptons. And then it came out that uh, you decided not to take the needle. And um, then it became a big kerfuffle. There were other actors that were quoted in this New York Post story that were saying, like, you know, I'm trying to protect my children and all kinds of hyperbolic nonsense. And um, and then you ended up getting replaced by that. And then things kind of fell out from there. So can you walk me through what, what happened? And, and you're suing the New York Post now. Is that correct? Yes, we did file a lawsuit for defamation against the Post. And I mean, that has also created a slew of responses. Everybody feels like they have a right to put in and and talk about uh, their opinions on that. Um, what happened was I was offered a one night concert uh, in the Hamptons, the venue, and which I agreed to do a month before we even started rehearsal, the venue uh, was going to mandate the vaccine. So the director, whom we both know, whom you've already mentioned in this podcast, reached out to me via email privately and oh, yeah. uh, I know you're talking and, about and reached out to everybody <laughs> privately and was like, so I'm just sussing it out for everybody, you know, want to make sure, love you all either way, but please let me know. And I wrote back and I was honest and I said, I'm not currently vaccinated. I guess I'll have to bow out of this one concert. I love you and hope all is well. If you need help finding a replacement, like let me know. And for me, it was worth it. It was worth the $200 I was getting paid to do this concert to just wait a little bit longer. Didn't quite feel peace about the vaccine. And I have my reasons for not getting it. I, I respect anybody that got it. I completely understand. I have no judgment towards anybody. Um, but I, at the time, I was like, I'm willing to, you know, not take this job. And she wrote back and said, no problem. We'll be bummed to miss you. Stay safe. Can't wait to work with you again. And then a week later, there was an article in the New York Post saying I was fired wow. for refusing to be vaccinated. And uh, again, all those kind of mischaracterizations. My co-star didn't ever talk to me and beg me to get it for the sake of his two children, of which he has one child. I know him <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> and like all of these things saying that I, I, I was vague about my status. Or, and then the narrative became that I lied about my status and I put my coworkers at risk. And I did not lie. In fact, I told the truth and I feel like I was punished for telling the truth, um, which was also, you know, hard. And I don't know, you know, pe people felt it was their business to somehow want to publicize, um, you know, that what should have been a private matter. And I think everybody has the freedom to choose what they want and what is right for them and their family. And within the entertainment industry, as we know, that is still not allowed. And um, so that's it. And then the firestorm of the media just took it and ran with it. And I did craft a response five days later. Um, I just felt like I didn't need to 
defend myself and try to convince anybody to agree with me, I knew that wasn't the case. But what I did need to do is tell the truth, let the truth be known. And people just didn't want to believe it, weren't ready to hear it. And I knew in an effort to attempt to try to at least get the truth out there, it really only made things worse and and spiraled. But I knew at that point that I was like, if I'm going down, I'm at least going down with dignity. And um and felt called to take a stand and act in courage instead of just wait for it to blow over and hope I could fit back in. Like I knew at that point, I was like, that's not authenticity. That's not like mm. I'm, I, we all <laughs> have a right to believe and stand for what we want. And again, like I said, I was never outspoken about things. I just felt called to love people in the industry. And uh, this is where it got me. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the saltiest thing I think I've ever heard you say. Um, yeah, yeah, it's you know, but it's it's really it's really disappointing because um, you know I mean I I didn't reach the heights that you did, but I was well on my way. And um, you know, it's an industry that's very heavily based in I call it R and R. It's reputation and relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, to see how quickly people got swept up in what I call hysteria, and um, and, you know, and I go back to my comment about it seems as though Trump's election is what really pushed people over the edge. I think part of the issue, and this goes back to this ideological rigidity that, that we experienced, that it became an issue of, you know, if, if you go along with this thing, that means you're one of the good people, a.k.a. you vote blue. And if not, then right. you're one of these other people. And, you know, and there's no once I realized that, I mean, there there were like career vaccinologists, for instance, who um, were being called anti-vax for, you know, questioning the wisdom of the mass vaccination campaign. And these are the kinds of, you know, sort of spirited discussions and debates, I think, that that should that would have been really useful at the beginning of all of this. So maybe that, you know, maybe cooler heads could have prevailed. But to see so many people not only turn their backs on me or you, um, I think what also gets me and you, you, you reference this as well is the people who can see what's going on and they know that it's not right. And yet they don't say anything. I mean, there's a couple of people that, um, you know, I, I try to be patient with, but you know, they get to keep their careers publicly. They post mm -hmm. on the, all, you know, all this other stuff, but then privately it's like, oh, these people are wearing masks. They're all crazy. They want more boosters, yada, yada, yada. And I'm thinking, and this one person in particular, you know, they, they said to me that, you know, I, I want to speak up like, like you, I just don't want to commit suicide, um, professional suicide, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that really, that really hit me in a certain kind of way because I said, you know, well, if more people were willing to step up and put their necks out, then this wouldn't be a problem. I mean, the Postal Workers uh, Union, I think, um, kind of organized and said, no, you're not going to, you know, we, we don't want this mandate. And there seemed to be no, there seemed to be no thought in anyone's mind that, um, that any other, you know, any other performers and performers, especially, especially at, 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 I'll say your level, um, <clears throat> you know, we're so health conscious anyway. And, you know, sure. so so the idea that um, any employer or any producer or any government body can can dictate what you, you know, inject into it and that, you know, relationships or your career can be based on, you know, can be dependent, dependent on upon. I know. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's so insane to me. And um, I think I think like people saw what happened to me and it made everybody right. afraid. I mean, mm. that's why no one wants to stand up because I didn't even make a stand. Someone <laughs> found out and caught and decided to make it public knowledge. And um, obviously I lot like, so everyone either felt like they had to distance them themselves from me or completely turn publicly against me. Um, and so that's, it's tricky. I've, I, I, but in the grand scheme of things, I mean, I have learned a lot. A lot of true colors were shown. I feel like this mm. has propelled me into new forms of artistry that I never would have considered. I've had to learn forgiveness. I've had to grow as a human being. I've had to develop a backbone. I'm a very sensitive person. And you said, alluded to at the beginning that I'm still smiling and I'm totally fine. And we've talked about this, the both of us together, but it's like that it's, it was hard. I, I finally tasted what depression felt like. I finally tasted mm -hmm. what anxiety felt like. I finally tasted what loss felt like. And, um, 
we've it's like how do you though go on in the midst of that how you can't hold on to bitterness forever I'm realizing I had to realize that my and I wrote a song called bitter I wrote a song about it so I used that and I told the truth and I said it's okay this is where I am in this season but healing it ha cannot be contingent upon the wrongdoer either apologizing or acknowledging or wanting forgiveness I, I I realized that holding on to all of that was actually the thing that was preventing my own healing and that I had to make a choice to forgive whether I got apologies or not and then also that it's a process it's forgiveness it feels like it's like oh I choose to forgive I acknowledge great over done it takes time and I feel like I'm a year and a half out and I'm still in the in that process but I can I'm so much more further on that journey now of choosing that but then acknowledging that it doesn't just happen overnight and I don't know about you but I have been able to have a few mending conversations with people from my previous life um and <laughs> and several and several not as well and I I've had to go that's okay I'm not gonna I can hate what you did and what happened, but I don't want to hate you. I don't want to hate the, the person. I still want to be someone who, otherwise I'm no better than them. You know what I mean? Like I still want to be the person that can be tenderhearted and loving in the midst of hatred and try to spread that message and, and use it to propel me into new things. You started a podcast. I started writing music. Like how can I use this pain? <laughs> <laughs> to maybe help other people or encourage other people or inspire other people. And that's what you are doing in ways you don't even know. And I think we're all called to fight in different ways. We're all like, like your friend. And I also, I have several people too, that are just trying to still stay under the radar. And you're like, come on. Like, but my, <laughs> my case was made very public. So I, people started writing to me privately going like, thank you for taking a stand. And I'm like, I did not volunteer for this, but I am trying. Right, right. And uh, it's been in the grand scheme of things, I feel like my character has grown so much. I like playing Nellie Forbush. I've had to expand in ways that I never thought possible as a human being. And it has not been easy, but um, those those stripes build character and build fortitude and build an endurance and a perseverance and i'm hoping that that example is the thing that can be an inspiration to people or help other people um to be courageous when given an opportunity yeah you know i keep i keep talking to um actors i spent the last week you know talking to actors and i'll release these uh conversations uh you know later but it, it, i keep running into people who I, I and this phrase keeps playing over and over again in my mind but it's like you know they're just they're too good for the industry <laughs> you, you, you know like maybe they just didn't belong just because they're they're so, such good people and uh, you know everything that you said about about bitterness i mean as you know i mean I, i've uh, mentioned to you privately you know it's one of the challenges of the past couple of years has been not being consumed by not just despair, but this overwhelming bitterness and not wanting to fall into this idea of these people hurt me and these people owe me. And, um, yes. you know, how do you, how do you move on from there? Yeah, totally. So I guess, you know, one of my, my penultimate question, uh, cause we're running up on time here is, uh, you know, what, what's, what is your perception of the industry now? I mean, you, you know, are, are you getting any rumblings that things are changing, that the that the gears are shifting? Um, as we're recording this, uh, Woody Harrelson made quite a big splash on Saturday Night Live the other night where he, uh, he sort of put a mirror up to uh, to the uh, to the audience in a way. And yep. um, but yet it seems as though the industry is still persisting in this thing, even though everywhere else is sort of i mean the military that you know the mandates are coming down for medical health care professionals um in new york and public employees public sector employees the mandates have come down exactly um you know and yet the entertainment industry seems to it, it's it's holding on to all this even though i mean like guys your, your show you can't even keep your shows open at this point like phantom of the opera closed Phantom right. of the Opera closed. And everybody's you know? still getting sick despite mandates. And everyone is still getting place. sick, you know? And uh, so at, at what point are, you know, 
A, you know, what is the state now from your insider spies or whatever? I love, I love you call it your former life because I, I call it the same thing as well. Yeah, um, I love I love actually what you said about like the city formerly known as New York. Yeah, well, that, that's we've adopted that as well. That's what it is to me now. You know, like 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 it. I mean, I wasn't there for 9-11, but it seemed like it bounced back from that. But with but with with the pandemic, you know, something something fundamentally shifted in the psychology of the city and that's mm -hmm. sort of, and the emotional makeup of the city and that's been the, the weird thing for me but where, but where do you think it stands now and uh, where does it go from here well i don't have a lot of insider spies anymore and i don't like i don't again really just i don't desire. care <laughs> I don't, I, I have had to let go of it. I yeah. really have, like, it's yeah. not healthy for me to continue to, I don't actually even want to be a part of it because of what mm. is continuing to go on there. And so I really, I really have let go of a lot of it, which is hard because it was my identity for so long. Right. And I think in order to heal, I've had to really realize who I am without that. And that I am still, I do still have value and my voice still matters, even though I felt so silenced in that realm. And that's my album is called On the Other Side. And I feel like I had to walk through that valley of figuring out who I am without that and go, okay, I'm coming out the other side. So my, my now distant kind of view is that I think the system is still kind of it's still broken. I mean, between you and I, and I, and I'm, I'm disheartened about it. I have compassion and empathy and sadness for, um, for that. And I think it, it like, they're going to have to figure it out on their own. And maybe it's going to take crashing and burning a little bit for eyes to be opened and hearts to be changed and realization to happen. And I know that like, my story happened and I, maybe I took some people with me and some, you know, fans stayed and a lot left. And I'm like, I just think it's going to, it's going to take time, but it's not my job to tell anybody how to do it. I'm going to be over here creating new art with new people. And if you want to come and be a part of that, cool. But now I'm like that they need, they have a lot to figure out and there's a lot of <laughs> healing that needs to happen. And I'm like, good luck on your journey. <laughs> I, it, it's tricky. It's, it's hard, but I, it still feels like it's, uh, there's still a little bit of a broken system and I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm disheartened to see it. And yet I'm like, well, I don't owe, I no longer owe you any of, of my heart. I had my time on Broadway. I'm grateful for it and onward new things. Well, uh, you know, I was going to say that, uh, I mean, I do have one more question for you. I don't know, you know, how, how a better way to end it than that. But um, but I, I'll ask it because I like to ask everyone this question nowadays. And, and that is, um, you know, we talk about culture wars and, and, and this and that. And there's so much um, tension, it feels like, in our sociopolitical landscape. And one of the things that I've been pondering over the past couple of years um, and maybe that's sort of the the gift, so to speak, of the universe, sort of, you know, of being shat out of the machine, um, you know, is that I sort of have time to reflect on things. And one of the things I've been reflecting on is, well, what what's even the point now? The point of what we do? Why do we train ourselves up um, that much? I mean, you mentioned bringing joy to people. I mean, I, I, there were literally nights when I was doing the play that goes wrong, where I just, I was sat up in bed crying at night. Cause I was just so grateful that I got to do this job. And like, you've never heard people laughing. I mean, like as if they were dying laughing for two straight hours in the theater. And, um, you know, it's such a brilliant show. And I was like, God, I'm so glad I get to do this, you know, over and over again, I get to get better every night and find new laughs and moments and, and people are just enjoying themselves. And it was great. Yeah. And I think one of my frustrations now with our sort of political bickering is that we're losing sight of what arts and artists can can do in terms of unification you know you can come and sit yes. in a dark dark room and no one knows who you are you know a bunch of strangers around you but you're both you're, but you're both there to witness this event playing out in front of you on stage or on screen and um and you know we get we get up get in the weeds in these conversations about legislation and economics and foreign policy but 
um, we often mention, even though we talk about culture war, like, you know, we don't talk about the art the culture produces unless we're complaining about it and, and how bad it is. So I say all of that to, to, to leave you with the weighty question of uh, what do you think, given everything we've covered and everything that we see going on today, what is the role of, of art and of artists in society now? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a big question. I think for me in this season, there is still an element of joy. The world needs joy. The world needs unity and healing. I think art still does have the power to heal, but I feel like now I have such a desire to create art with a whole different group of people and not trying to fit in with the systems that currently exist. We talked about decentralization. And I think for a while, Broadway thought it owned art. Hollywood thought it owned TV film. And mm -hmm. going like, I'm, I'm actually not going to let you have that authority. You can't silence me. I can still sing outside of that realm. I can still tell a story. If you're not going to let me play, I'll create my own. Um, and I hope that the way that these industries are acting are actually curating a generation of artists who are going to boldly create authentic work <laughs> for themselves. Like that's what I see in this season of going like, there's so many people moving. I'm currently in Nashville. There's so many people moving here, I think to Atlanta as well, who are over what's happening in the entertainment industry right now. Mm -hmm. And for those that still want to be a part of that, okay, fine. But I think there's a lot of whatever, pain, anxiety, fear that is still very crippling in those worlds. And that is not art and that is not creativity. And that's not a community that I really want to be a part of. So I'm excited to be here. And it feels like I'm a part of something in Nashville that is going to be built from the ground up instead of trying to fit into a system that already exists. And um, again, I hope other people are inspired to create their own thing right now um, in this season. I think at the end of the day, as artists, we are still called to bring joy, to heal, to share those gifts, to be truth tellers. And honestly, to not, to remember that art doesn't need to have an agenda. I feel like too, the industry is very agenda driven still. Yeah. And people are sick of that. People just wanna be entertained, um, be inspired, be challenged. I'm not afraid of addressing difficult issues, but to be told how to thought or, or to think, um, or to be told that you can only think a certain way or will only love you if, that's, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to create art <laughs> that is a part of that. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's where I'm at. Well, you know, I'm going to roast you one more time because uh, in, in the in the months long build up to this uh, epic conversation, uh, Miss Osnes was telling me, I don't know what to say. And I got to get my I got to get my talking points together. And you know, and something told me that uh, you were going to do fine. And uh, and, <laughs> and you have. I hope that uh, people take away from this conversation. I think they'll get a lot of value from it, but uh, your 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 strength of character really shines through. And um, I'll go on the record and say that what has happened to you and many of us is unconscionable and awful. And um, and I know, you know, we have to forgive, but uh, it, it but it's unforgivable and um, good, hardworking, um, gifted, um, just talented, wonderful people like you are being purged. And uh, I think Many are also leading voluntarily at this point because of just what you said, yeah. just they're tired of it. Um, but, you know, I have your hope as well, which is that, you know, new things are happening and people are, are forming, you know, their little collectives in other places and figuring yes. out some really cool stuff. And we have technology now to, um, to help us share our work with the world. And uh, so all that uh, to say that uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you know, please leave some comments. What shows do you think that uh, that Laura and I should do together? What 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 will we be good in? We've uh, been dreaming and scheming. We've been, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big fan of all the classic stuff. I mean, you're, you're a Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, person. I'm very much a Rodgers and Hammerstein guy myself. Maybe maybe um, that can work out. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can crowdfund something. Who knows? Yes. But, uh, you know, but uh, her, her Let name, us know what you want to see. 
Yes, yes. See, and this is the great thing, too. And this is, you know, my last sort of mini rant is that, you know, I go to all these theater pages and, you know, the comments are always turned off and everything. It's like, guys, no, like you're posting stuff to YouTube and this is the best thing ever. You have direct audience feedback, you know, who are, who are telling you what they like and what they don't like. And you have it in real time. And, and it's really and it's real. You know, it's just it's as direct as direct can be. And, you know, I think back again to the theater and it's like, you know, they, they talk about how they want to. They want to have an audience that reflects the world outside and, you know, they want to have a, a shows that reflect the world outdoors. I'm like, well, you know, have any of you ever conducted any surveys or any interviews, just talk to people, you know, talk to the guy that cleans up trash in Times Square? Or have you ever talked to the people that rappel off the side of skyscrapers? Have you talked to your, to, your, to the garbage people, to the fire off, to the fire uh, fighters, the police officers? you know, the, the people who deliver your food, the people who work at the bodega, have you ever spoken to them directly and ask them mm -hmm. what kind of shows they want to see, ask them what kind of issues are important to them? Um, and I think, but the problem is we live in an, we're in an industry now, or at least we were, the industry is, um, you know, those kinds of people are being increasingly dismissed as like crazy far right lunatics and Nazis and fascists. And like, no, that is your lifeblood. That's that's your audience that you're talking about and, and, that, and that you're denigrating. So um, so hopefully, you know, they'll I'm not going to be that vindictive. I was going to say they play stupid games and win stupid prizes um, in New York. But uh... I just uh, like I just want people to be willing to have a conversation mm -hmm. and go. I don't have to you don't have to agree with me 100 percent to be my friend. You and I are here today. We We went through an experience that I feel like bonded us, that we are able to agree and have some foundation um, <laughs> that we can really relate on and understand each other. However, we think very differently about a lot of things too. And that's good. That's okay. We don't want to live in a world where everybody thinks the same way, but the industry right now, that is kind of the narrative and even, uh, even questioning or maybe having a, a different point of view, just like wasn't allowed, wasn't okay. And the last thing I want to say too, is that the narrative also became like, Laura, you did this to yourself by making this decision yeah. and i i just i hope some level of humanity can just be found in the midst of this of going i didn't i i, I made a decision i voluntarily backed out i understand people were anyway we don't have to get back into it but just going that it's like let's can anyone just have a conversation is anyone willing to understand a potentially why someone might make a different choice or potentially have a different point of view on something and what I can learn something. I can grow from that. Um, and just being open. I think hopefully people are beginning to come out on the, on the other side of that. And I think I've found a new community of people here that are that way. Um, and that's been really refreshing and lovely. Um, and I hope you can find that too, Clifton. I think you you have found such a following that you know there are people in the world that were like, oh, we're not alone and we're not the, the crazy ones, you know? Well, that, that's also relative because we, we were in show business, so. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, her name is Laura Osnes. Her new album is called On the Other Side. And um, I think that uh, we can all agree in this time of great division that uh, you are just as radiantly beautiful on the inside as you are on the outside. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ms. Austin. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.